So without further ado, Mike Shaw. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Your mission here in this group is to not be in that group. Today's topics are valuations, the inflation deflation debate, a few investments that look attractive to me. There's not very many, actually. Patience, why well, you need lots of it, especially right now. If you're hugely long this market, valuations say you shouldn't be. Margin debt says you shouldn't be. History says you shouldn't be. Jeremy Grantham had some pertinent comments in an interview on Charlie Rose um, just a few weeks ago. He said there's an enormous pressure in the investment deliver business to deliver good news. Trust me, good news sells better. Stockbrokers thrive on it. To go out there in a bubble and talk about how overpriced the markets are is an invitation to get fired. Now, well, starting with my next chart, I'm about to get fired. This is uh, a chart of, uh, that we put together at Sitka with data from Robert Schiller. Shows real inflation adjusted 10 year average earnings. John Hussman talked about these earlier today. But um, look at those peaks on the right hand side. We had a huge peak in, the, in, in 2000 with a dot com bubble. We had an even higher peak in uh, the housing bubble. And that third peak there at the end in blue is uh, what's happened here with the rebound of the stock market. So the market might look cheap, and that's what the industry wants you to believe. You know, they say, you know, based on current earnings, that's that top blue line there at the end of the right, the, uh, they, they say that the market looks cheap. Well, as we've seen here, and as John's talked about earlier, earnings fluctuate over time, and those fluctuations give a false impression that the market is cheap near cyclical highs. That's the impression that it's giving you right now. And it gives you uh, the inverse. It, it says that the markets are expensive at the bottom. Well, the 10-year average of earnings smooths those things out. That's the uh, uh, red line. And, and the dotted dashed line is, is kind of like an average projection. And uh, the market looked cheap in 2000 and 2007. It looks cheap again now, but it's not. So why are people so blind to bubbles? People don't want to see bubbles. The industry has a vested interest in getting you to believe that there are no bubbles. Just the numbers. When asked how he identified so many financial bubbles, Jeremy Grantham said, just the numbers. For those who pay attention, it's relatively easy to do. It's, you can spot right there on the chart how expensive markets are based on valuations. However, very difficult as an investment manager, if we go through it now, uh, and individuals to avoid investing in those markets. Why? Because expensive markets are always very popular. When the bubbles do pop, the blame, the blame game begins. And look at where the blame was placed. People blame the rating agencies. People blame the end of Glass-Steagall. People blame the rack, lack of regulation. People point at fingers every which direction except at themselves and except at the Fed. And it's the Fed and fractional reserve lending policies, the loose money policies of the Fed, and that benefits those with first access to money. And who has first access to money? Well, it's banks, governments via taxation, and the already wealthy. Demographic headwinds. I'm not a big follower of Fed reports for, for obvious reasons, but occasionally uh, the uh, Fed understudy research departments comes up with some excellent research. In late 2011, the San Francisco Fed, you know, came up with a model that said, um, look, that took a look at the historical relationship between age distribution of the population and uh, PE ratios. What they found, and that, that MO is the ratio of the middle age cohort to, uh, which is people aged 40 to 49, to the old age cohort. Uh, cohort, which is age 60 to 69. Between 1981 and, and, and 2000, baby boomers reached the peak of their working and saving years. The MO ratio increased from about 0.18 to about 0.74. And during the same PE year, during the same period, the PE ratio tripled from 8 to 24. In the 2000s, as the baby bus generation started aging, MO and PE ratios declined substantially. So what does history suggest? History suggests that the 10-year average of earnings 
is, which is 23 right now, is one of the most richest valuations in history, in spite of what that first chart that I showed said. If the demographic model that the San Francisco Fed put together holds true, I don't know if it will, but it says that the PE ratio is going to de decline all the way to 8.4 in 2025. Wow. Imagine what the stock market's going to look like if the PE ratio sinks and the earnings project as Hussman and I think they're going to, which is either negative or extremely slow growth from here. Uh, if earnings and normalized PE ratios simultaneously dive, there's going to be a pretty devastating collapse in the stock market. Now, it's impossible to forecast precisely when this is going to happen or if it does, but uh, I think it will. And once it starts, the trend lines on that last chart, as I showed, suggest that the market's going to overshoot to the downside far faster than anyone thinks. There's three myths that don't add up. First one's a forecast of current earnings. The second one is the idea that the Fed can perpetually inflate asset prices. And the third idea is that gold is overvalued. We discussed the first two. Let's, let's take a look at the third. Here's a chart we put together of the uh, Federal Reserve balance sheet versus gold. The uh, left-hand scale is the monetary base in billions of dollars. And we can see what this chart has looked like over time. Certainly when, when gold spiked to uh, $850 in uh, 1980, that middle yellow spike there, perhaps gold was a little bit overvalued. Uh, this all came about when France threatened to redeem its U.S. dollars for gold. Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, ending convertibility of dollars for gold. That was the end of the Bretton Woods uh, currency exchange. Explosion of credit followed. After blasting from a fixed rate of $35 an ounce to $850, uh, gold sank. Gold fell from uh, all the way to 250 in 2000. What happened? Well, the chart suggests that Perhaps gold just got a little bit ahead of itself in terms of price. Also, Fed Chairman Paul Vol Volcker tamed inflation a bit with a huge set of rate hikes. This price inflation gave way to price disinflation. And disinflation, I mean a, a falling rate of, of prices. In periods of disinflation and in periods where people think the Fed has everything under control, gold tends to do poorly. Here's a chart I put together called Great Moments in Fiat History. Well, they're not really so great, actually. But uh, L LBJ had this idea that he was going to have a war on poverty and, and, end, um, and end poverty. Well, we saw a little spike up there. In 1971, Nixon closed the gold window. In 1994, Greenspan uh, goosed, them, goosed everything by effectively ending reserve clients with a program he called Sweeps. And then you can see the rest of it here. 2008 to present, we've had recessions, a housing bubble, a dot-com bubble we've had. And, and that, that final little blip there at the end, that's what we're calling austerity right now, yeah, that, that little downturn there. For decades, economists have thought the holy grail of ending the business cycle. All they've ever done is fooled themselves. Increasing money supply while lowering interest rates just gives the appearance of increased economic activity. What central banks and governments miss is that artificially low interest rates invariably stimulates a misallocation of capital. Sometimes that's pretty glaring, as it was with the housing bubble. Pretty obvious, right? Even, even then, Bernanke couldn't see it. And they can't see it again right now, even though I think it's pretty glaring, and you can see it in just the plunge in yields on U.S. Treasuries. Is there any real value there? Uh, I don't think so. This is what a uh, long-term bear market looks like under a fiat currency. Uh, line in purple is uh, the S&P price in gold. Now, as the gold has soared and the S&P has plunged on a relative basis, where would you have wanted your money over since 1999? Well, gold has risen from, from 250 to so about 1,600 an ounce now, a little bit less than that. And uh, what, the S&P has been basically flat. The uh, blue line is, uh, is PE10 valuations. That's the 10-year smooth average earnings that uh, John Hussman and, and I have both talked about today. There's a lot of bubbles out there. I, I think the bond market's back in a bubble. Uh, and the treasury market's in a bubble. Junk bonds are in a bubble. The yes, stock market's in a bubble. One of the biggest bubbles of all, actually, is a belief bubble. And it's the belief that Bernanke uh, has everything under control. 
And uh, <laughs> the only lasting benefits to what the Fed has done is to create one big bubble after another. Uh, uh, first in dot-com stocks, then in housing, and, and now they've managed to do it in, in bonds and junk bonds. We found out in 2000, 2001, and then again in 2007 and 2009 that the Fed wasn't in control. Yet amazingly, everyone seems to think the Fed has things under control right now. I've talked a lot about inflation and deflation on my blog, and regular followers probably know where this is heading, but I'd like to go over it for the rest of you. You know, do we have inflation or deflation? Uh, it's safe to say we do. Which one? <laughs> well, you know, it, it depends. And what does the future hold? Well, that depends too. Does anyone care to guess what it depends on? It depends on the definition. Everything hinges on the de definition of inflation and deflation. I have people arguing with me all the time. Yeah, it's my God, what's the matter with you? Look at, look at uh, the inflation we've got here. And of course, they're basing it on money supply. And you know, some people might be really reading John William Shadow stats. They think prices are going up you know, 10, 12, 15% a year. Now, if you think inflation is about prices, I'll, I'll get to my definition in a moment, then it's, I would contend that it's quite likely that the CPI is going to be positive more often than not if the Fed keeps on doing what it's doing. Yet, even in spite of that, you know, uh, a lot of the hyperinflationists out there said we would never see CPI go negative, and they also said we would see hyperinflation before deflation. Well, they were wrong. But we can look at the CPI another way here. This is a chart that uh, Doug Short, an advisor perspective, <coughs> built for me. I, I asked him to produce this chart. I said, well, you know, let's take a look at prices that have gone up and, and some, that, some that haven't. Well, price inflation, again, I don't think that's a very good definition, but uh, price inflation has gone up the most where there's been the most government interference in free markets, and that's student loans and health care. That's the uh, top two red lines there. The uh, inflation's gone up the least in places where there's genuine competition and little government interference, like apparel, computers, and electronics. Apparel is that bottom line there. Now, it's gone nowhere here for a decade. But I also want to focus on how the BLS measures housing. And it's that dark blue line in the middle. And the BLS thinks housing prices have gone up about 35% since 2000 in a very smooth manner. I don't think that that's what's happened at all. In fact, if we look at actual home prices, <laughs> this is the HPI, the uh, LPS HPI index, the home price index. We see that rental prices, which is how the BLS measures things, it's uh, uh, the component in the uh, CPI that measures housing is called OER, it stands for Owner's Equivalent Rent. And it's actually a measure of two things. It's a measure of the first one is, is actual rental prices. And the second thing that people don't realize is OER, the government actually goes out there and surveys people. And they say, how much would you rent your house from? Or your, how much would your house rent if you rented it yourself? They actually ask people what their house would rent for. And, and that is a component in, in the CPI. The owner's equivalent rent is the largest component in the CPI. And uh, you know even if it's was measuring true rental prices, that's not, rent and, and home prices got three or four standard deviations apart. We saw a big bubble, it was right here, it should be obvious to everyone, but somehow it wasn't obvious to the Fed. I decided, and I said, okay, what if we just strip out OER from the CPI? And we put in, uh, I forget the exact percentage, I'm gonna say it's like 25%, 23% or something is, uh, 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 housing is the largest component in the CIA. I said, let's put actual home prices in there and, and see what this thing looks like. The uh, green area there, that's actually the Fed's funds rate. And uh, the red line is the CPI with HPI replacing OER. And the blue line is the, the actual CPI. You see a number of interesting things on here. Um, one of them is in, in, in 2008, I've got a purple annotation there, uh, we had this big inflation scare. Oil was, was soaring up above $140 an hour, and people were saying, my God, Miss, you're nuts. Look at, you know, look at how much inflation there is. How come you don't see it? And I didn't have this chart back then, but I kind of knew you know, what this thing would, would look like intuitively. 
Well, interest rates were still about 4%, yet look at that first little dip down there in, in red. Um, if you just put home prices in the CPI, CPI was already negative. In other words, real interest rates were actually 4% positive there. And, you know, is it any wonder then, you know, is, is that the Fed was behind the curve? We, we saw a, an amazing series of, of moves by Bernanke, you know, catching up to home prices falling. But, you know, the impact of, of that on the credit markets was, was rather a, uh, outstanding. And, uh, you know, here we go again. You know, the Fed's trying to stimulate things. And um, I don't know, they want to re-blow the bubble. Answer the question, inflation, what the heck is it? Well, Wikipedia says it's a rise in the general level of prices. That's actually what the Fed wants you to believe. That's the widely held definition. The 1957 Merriam-Webster def definition of inflation was an increase in money supply and credit. Wow. The definition in Merriam-Webster now is an increase in general price level attributed to an increase in the volume of money and credit. Now, the 1957 definition is, is probably the accurate one, at least reasonably close. The Fed wants you to believe inflation is about prices, and the reason why they want you to believe it's about prices is because they can go out there and they can talk about capacity utilization and they can talk about all these other nonsensical things. Um, but if they actually talked, if they actually went out there and said inflation is an increase in money supply, my God, you know, they want you to believe that they're inflation fighters. And uh, the definition, I believe, has changed over the years on purpose by people who want you to believe that the Fed's an inflation fighter. The correct definition shows that the central bankers are actually charlatans. The correct definition shows the Fed is the source of inflation. You know, who else is increasing the money supply if not the Fed? Um, misguided hyperinflation fears. The Fed balance sheet ballooned to 3.2 trillion, huge increase percentage-wise. Hyperinflationists and some Austrian economists came out of the woodwork and went, Mish, my God, what's the matter with you? This is going to cause hyperinflation. And I said, really? Uh, the total credit market's $50 trillion. You know, the Fed's got a monetary base and blown to $3.2 trillion. Uh, I, that monetary base, uh, the total amount of money that's actually been lent on that small credit, uh, uh, small monetary base is, is phenomenal. And, you know, much of the, you know, increase in the, supply of, uh, of the 3.2 trillion that the Fed's printed that everyone's worried about is actually sitting there as excess reserves. We talked about that earlier. I, I don't believe there's any excess reserves at all. But the reason why I don't think there is a strong bird of uh, inflation coming anytime soon is because credit growth is anemic and much of the credit growth that we've seen is in the form of student loan. And they're defaulting on those. I believe banks are still capital fair, uh, impaired. I think there's few credit worthy borrowers that, that banks want to lend to. And money that's already been lent, I don't believe it can pay it back. I don't think $50 billion can be paid back. So um, this is the deflationist case for gold. In spite of what money supply says, it's not in strongly inflationary backdrop. Credit expansion and contraction, especially um, credit mark to market, which is actually my definition of inflation, and increase in money supply and credit mark to market, um, uh, real interest rates are nonetheless negative. That's generally positive for gold. Gold hasn't responded lately, I think, because nothing moves in a straight line. And more importantly, I think there's a renewed bubble belief that the Fed and the central banks have everything in control. In periods of disinflation, when things appear to be in control, when inflation is, is, is moderating, gold tends to underperform. It did in that entire period from 1980 to, to um, 2000. In periods of credit stress and deflation, gold tends to outperform. And by deflation here, I'm talking about you know, concerns about the quality of credit. You know, I can't say when, but I can promise you that renewed credit stress, probably starting in Europe or Japan, is a certainty, and that's why this deflationist happens to like gold. Beware the cheerleaders. James Glassman, author of the spectacularly wrong book, Dow 36,000, he wrote that in, what, uh, 1999. He's back at it. He, he says, 36,000 is again within reach. All it takes, this is what he said, all it takes is another 147% route. Wow. Uh, history suggests that Glassman wasn't thinking then, and I suggest he isn't thinking now. The, but he's not the only one. Everywhere I look, I have people coming out of the woodwork telling me, you know, why this market is cheap and what companies ought to be doing with their cash. You know, 
Abby Joseph Cohen was on Bloomberg on Tuesday. She said, corporations have too much cash. Wow, too much cash. Well, here's a post I did just last week on my blog, a little snap chart of, uh, of it. And, and it shows, th th this is a, a, uh, the top 50 companies in the S&P. We went out there and we went out there in Yahoo Finance and we totaled up all the cash they had on hand, all of it, and, uh, of the top 50 companies. Net cash is a negative $849 billion. Well, you know, and Abby Joseph Golden wants them to spend that. Now, a handful of companies actually do have, have cash on hand. It, it, it's the big ones. You, you can, you know, guess uh, uh, Apple and Microsoft have some cash on hand, a few others. Even if one counts short-term investments as cash, net cash is negative $543 billion. What about the N and the Nike? Most in the U.S. could care less about the N or Japan. Actually, people are focusing on it now, but for a different reason. And uh, if nothing else, people needed to be looking at Japan for a history lesson. Japan's in the middle of its third last decade here now. Demographics and PE cycles suggest that, I believe, suggest a scenario like this in the United States is, is quite possible. But has anyone here thought about Japanese equities in a positive way? Anyone here like Japan? Can I say a show of hands? Anyone likes Japanese equities? Two, three, because my hand is up. Well, while most eyes are on the S&P expecting more and more, I, I, I happen to like Japanese stocks. After 30 years of, of deflation, unlike U.S. corporations loaded up with debt, most debt's been wiped off the balance sheets of Japanese corporations in, in 25 years. The P.E. ratios, unlike here, look reasonable to me. The Nikkei 225 trades near its book value. The only fly in the assignment is, is the value of the N, which I think is going to plunge. Now, I'm uh, quite in line here with, with uh, Hussman and uh, probably Chanos thinking that, uh, the, the, that uh, the N is not where you want to be. But a, but a really good paired trade to me is being long Japanese stocks and being short the N. So, uh, you know, if the Yen falls to pieces, the Nikkei is likely to soar. And if both of them happen, you, you're likely to win on both sides of the trade. And that is indeed a, a, a paired trade that we're in right now. This whole speech has really been about the case for cash and patience. Uh, you know, we're sitting in a l lot of cash right now, and cash earns nothing. But doesn't lose anything either, unless inflation is running rampant. And as discussed, I don't believe inflation is running rampant. So I'm casting my vote for history. So my, my two messages here for everyone is don't just do something, sit there. And while you're sitting, sit on some gold. All right, you know I love you, so I'm going to ask you more uh, questions. Uh, I know you do, Chris. <laughs> All right. So central to the deflationist argument is the idea that debts are, are too large and that when they're defaulted upon, money goes to heaven. Uh, here's a question. What prevents central banks from just putting all that defaulted debt on their balance sheets and letting it just die a quiet death there behind the scenes? What prevents them? Technically, they could probably do it. The question is, would they want to do it? And I, and I don't believe they would. Um, the, the last thing that the central bank wants to do is, is bail out consumers at the expense of the banks. So if, if they, we take all of these housing debts and uh, other debts that you know corporations have, and we bail them out. Well, that's going to cheapen the dollar, and I don't think the Fed wants. To, I don't think the Fed generally wants to ruin the currency that way. Certainly, they don't want to bail out the homeowners. If you actually look at what's happened, is they've made debt slaves out of students. They've made debt slaves uh, uh, out of people who are underwater in their houses. And I don't think they're about to bail them out at the expense of banks, and that's what would happen. So is anyone stopping them from doing that? Uh, I don't think they want to destroy the currency, and I don't think they want to do it in a manner that would destroy the banks and take them down and end the Fed's power. So I don't think that that's the model we're under. All right. Questions? Yeah. The, the credit prices are running rampant. Yes. And if the printing presses are running rampant, uh, the, that cash has to end up somewhere. One of the things that I believe that we're seeing is, is that there is a devaluation of the dollar against other currencies. Uh, 
a lot of other currencies are also devaluing, but it seems like it's a race to the bottom uh, on currencies for exporting for co countries on their export numbers. Where uh, your, your, uh, out there you've got cashers, nothing, but it also loses nothing, uh, and it's better to sit on cash. Well, are we not in a, a point now ish where? Uh, you're going to start losing value of the dollar? I don't know. The U.S. dollar is going up. I, in fact, I'm, I'm one of those that, that actually like gold and like the U.S. dollar. There have not been very many of us, and, and I believe have been on the right side of, of, of both of those. Uh, um, uh, you're right. It's competitive currency debasement. And uh, I think we're likely to see renewed effort from the ECB once Spain goes, and I think Spain is going to go. Uh, Japan has certainly stepped to the forefront of that. The uh, Bank of England has uh, got, what, uh, Carney from, uh, from Canada, and he's coming over there and he's basically said that he's going to do exactly what Bernanke did. So, uh, um, and the banks in Europe, I believe, are worse off than the banks in the United States by a lot. Uh, I think the banks in China are insolvent. I think Japan is going to win the race to see who can blow up their currency first. So all of those things happen to be net positive for now. I mean, the surprising thing to me is, is that gold hasn't you know, lifted off even more, even though I did kind of explain why. You know, nothing goes up for, for in, a, in a straight line forever. But you know, there's a chance when this all falls apart, and I, and I think it's guaranteed that it's all going to fall apart, that gold and gold mining stocks and, and, and other assets go down with it initially, and that's actually what happened in, in 2008. But you know they quickly rebounded, and gold went on to a new high. And uh, and it also has to do with a matter of prudence. I mean, you know, how much do you want to bet on the gold block? You know, some people are comfortable putting 75% on it, and uh, some people are only comfortable putting 20% on it or 10%. What you don't want to do is put more on that play than, than you can sleep with at night. Because the last thing you want to do is, is wheel into this thing, have gold you know, fall another 100 bucks, you panic out at a low just as gold's about ready to double to 3,000. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of prudence when I say you know, have some spare cash. If gold goes down, buy some. If assets fall through the floor again, which I think they're likely to do, then you'll have some cash on hand to buy some other assets. I'm fond of the energy sector long term. I'm just not fond of the energy sector now. I'm fond of commodities long term, but I side with Pettis right now in terms of, of what this correction in China is going to look like to commodities and to the commodity producing currencies and to the commodity producing countries like you know, Australia and Canada, for example. All right. Next question, over in the corner. Yeah. Would you take a minute and just connect the um Dots for me in terms of the steps that happen when the, when the Fed prints another eighty-five billion dollars. How that steps through um, into the, the markets and especially into the equity market. Uh, uh, Hussman doesn't believe it does, and actually, I, I don't believe it does either. But I think you you might disagree with me. You want to chime in on that, Chris? Can you repeat the question? Can you repeat the, question? The, the question was um, when the Fed prints eighty-five billion. How does that? sneak into the market. It, it's, it's pretty common now to look at these all-time highs in the Dow and, and, and then read associated commentary that says, and of course that's because the Fed's printing. So the question is, how does that happen? And you have to look at the mechanism. So when the Fed buys, they're buying 45 billion of treasuries, 40 billion of, of uh, mortgage-backed securities, maybe I have that backwards, but uh, something like that. So what they're gonna do is, is they'll say, hey, we wanna buy $8 billion worth of treasuries in this sort of part of the maturity curve. And then you're a company that has some in that place and you, you offer them up, you tender them up. And if the Fed accepts your bid, they'll take a billion dollars, say, from you and you have now a billion dollars in cash. What are you going to do with that? And so that cash is finding its way into the markets because, as we found out earlier today, you know, cash, at zero, cash that's earning zero is not really a favorable thing. You're, you're going to look for something to do. You could roll it right back into treasuries, but that might defeat your original purpose. So. The idea here is that that money is coming out and it's sitting there at zero percent and it's going off to find things to do. And it finds its way into the markets uh, in potentially a lot of ways because the primary ones that are, that are putting these things up for bid are the primary dealers. These are very big banks. 
uh, and money center bet institutions that, that are uh, taking all that cash. So that, that's the, the basic process. Some, someone still has to hold the cash, which is, which is what John pointed out, and which is what I would point out too. However, what the Fed has achieved by this is changing the psychology of the market. And it's the, it's the change in the psychology of the market that, that, that says that the people want to be you know, a little bit more aggressive in terms of, 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 of what it is they buy and getting rid of that cash and what it takes you know, for them to do it. That's the actual mechanism. It, 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 it's, it's one of psychology as opposed to the cash is actually finding its way into the market. What I what I'm hearing today a lot of is all the countries in the world are trying to debase their currencies to increase their exports to find home for their products, their supplies. On the other hand, is the country, the same country, are all increasing huge amounts of debt, sovereign debt, to keep their economy going to create demand to buy these supplies. So it's like we're creating, the world's creating a lot of supplies, but can only sell or there's only enough demand as long as you sell to people that are going broke can't pay you. <laughs> because you've got the governments are all going broke to keep their demand up while they're trying to shut the currency down to say something to the other guy who's also going to go over his currency so he can buy his stuff. So in the end, we're, we're producing a lot more stuff than we bought unless we're willing to sell to countries that can finance their economies on debt. Is there a question there? Yeah. The question is, how, that, how is that only in terms of deflation or some sort of what Mitch is talking about? How does, how does that affect in the end? I mean, they all print money. I can understand why gold is up they all be based. But at some point, that the minting moment comes, and what happens to gold? So if everybody's printing, how does this really solve anything worldwide when they're all sort of insolvent, everybody's trying to sell to other insolvent and countries, and, 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 and what's the effect on gold? And one other thing, and we're all, we tell the Greeks, for example, you guys have to go up to be more productive. We're telling the Spaniards, be more productive. We can't sell the product without balance because some people can't pay for it. So the question is, how do you produce your way out of this? I mean, individual country as a whole, how do you produce your way out of this if, if the whole system collectively it takes on debt to buy it. is already too far in debt to really afford all the things? So how do we how do we consume our way out of a, a hole that we consumed our way into? Right. So I got it. I'm I'm going to take a little bit of an interesting aspect of, of what I think you're really getting at here is is and because you you mentioned it you know how does Greece become more like Germany and how does Spain become you know more like Germany? Well, actually they can't. And that's one of the problems of, of the euro. The, uh, uh, in, in terms of interest rates, well, when, this, when the Spanish uh, housing bubble was, was going gangbusters, clearly interest rates in Spain were, were way too low relative to, to Germany. But there's no mechanism in the eurozone for Spain to have a higher interest rate, uh, uh, at least in theory. Now, the bond market uh, uh, you know, tanked and over the last couple of years, Mario Draghi bailed him out with, with his LTRO program, long-term refinance operations. And interest rates uh, uh, in Italy, in Spain, and Greece actually then plunged, but they're not back down to the level of, of where they're at in Germany. But technically, they're all supposed to be the same because it's all supposed to be one currency. Well, Cyprus has capital controls. That goes against the tenets of the uh, uh, treaty that actually formed the Maastricht Treaty that, that, that uh, was the foundation for creation of the Eurozone. So we, we can see that they, we have these fundamental issues there that, that say that different countries need different interest rates, and the Eurozone prevents that from happening. What's, what's ultimately going to happen, if, if, if we go the austerity way, which is what you know, Germany wants, Spain and Italy and, uh, 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 and Ireland and, and Greece and Cyprus to do now, well, Unemployment rate has to go up even further. The Spanish unemployment rate now is, is 26%. They want more austerity in there. Unemployment rate is going to rise further. This is what, what, what Michael Pettis and I would, would argue and say, you know, at some point, the people are going to say, enough of this. You know, uh, uh, at some point, the people are going to say, you know, they're going to elect someone that's going to hold up a copy of this matrix tree, and they're going to tear it in shreds, and they're going to say, you know what, this thing is null and void. Now, we've not seen that person yet. We might see him in Beppe Grillo in, in, in Italy, but that's what's going to happen. You know, ultimately, the pain is going to be more than one of these countries is going to bear, and then Germany is going to pay the price one way or another. 
Because if these countries exit the Eurozone, they're going to default on Germany. Or Germany has to supply the cash to bail out Spain. Right now, we've got neither of those happening. So, you know, how does, how does uh, Spain become more like Germany? Only if they exit the Eurozone. We got a question over here? Yes. Uh, last question, sorry. I was curious, with all we've heard today in the threat of default, particularly uh, in Europe, what are the implications for the United States banking system? Do, we, do you think there's a significant chance of, of widespread bank failures in the United States? What is the, the possibility of bank failure contagion from Europe yes. affecting U.S. banks is the question? Um, wow. The, uh, the banks in the United States are probably in much better shape than the banks in Europe. I think the U.S. banking system is insolvent, but I think the Chinese banking system and the European banking system is more insolvent. So to me, it's a question of <laughs> who gets hit first, and, and this is another reason why all of the dollar bearers have, have, are probably going to be wrong, and all the hyperinflationists are probably going to be wrong, because at least for the next interim period, you know, before there's this, I mean, there's always a chance that, that Japan precipitates this you know, global crisis, or that Japan, Italy, Spain all have you know, currency crises of their own all simultaneously. That's highly possible. But if we kind of like muddle through with country after country leaving the Eurozone and the implications thereof, you know, the United States is actually going to look relatively sound uh, uh, compared to what Japan is doing, compared to what the UK is doing, compared to what's happening in the Eurozone. So yeah, the U.S. is going to have its problem. We've, we've got our day of reckoning coming. I just think it's further down the road than a lot of the hyperinflationists here in the United States think. All right, thank you, Mish.